So welcome everyone. Good to have you today. So today there's a question. Okay, so question is, Hi, Toby, I have two questions. I'm slowly realizing that presence in the body is the way out of the crazy world of the mind. Apart from meditating, are there other methods to increase the feeling of the body? Additionally, in the video you say that you inform your mindfulness. How do you do that? Okay. Well, the, the way to increase the feeling in the body is by habituating yourself to it. It's as simple as that. It boils down to doing it continuously, remembering your body continuously. That's not so easy for us because, as you all know, we're mostly caught up in mental stories throughout the entire day about what did happen, what might happen, what will happen, why it happened the way it happened, and if there could have been anything that I could have done to avoid that or to make it differently. Maybe I should do things better in the future. And who will I become? What will happen with my life? Why will it happen? And so this constant story is in our head is taking up the majority of our attention. Is something I do not have to prove to you in any way. This is something you can experience for yourself. It's not a matter of belief or faith or anything. Just by looking at yourself, by truly experiencing the way it is, right now, right here, and by looking at your mind, you will see it. This constant judgment, constant talking, comparing, seeking, confusion, in other words. And this is not a voluntary thing, you know. We are not sitting down and, and we're opting in for a round of confusion. Like, hey, let's spend the day in total craziness in the mind, worrying about this and that. This is not like a decision you make. It just happens continuously. And most of the time, we don't realize it is happening. For many people, in fact, for most people who are new to meditation, it's kind of a surprise to, to realize all of a sudden that the, there is a voice in their head most of the time. Most people are unaware of that, even. And for most meditators, also, most of the time we're unaware that there is a voice in our head telling us how to think, how to feel about certain people or certain events. So to counteract that, we bring our attention into the body, feeling the body fully. And is that easy in the beginning? Not really, because we never really do it due to all the thinking. Our attention is caught up in that. So it's kind of, you need to start slowly and then give it time and consistency. There is a certain need for effort. But it's not that sort of effort that you think, oh, well, now I'm a Buddhist, I should be doing that. Or now I'm religious, so I should be doing that. Or I'm a meditator, so I should be doing that. It's not that kind of effort. Like kind of blind obedience to some sort of thing that you're now supposed to do. Because someone said so. But it is something that is more an act of kindness towards yourself. You kind of realize wow, I basically suffer so much for no reason because of the voice in my head. It doesn't let me sleep at night. It constantly finds fault and complaints. Unless 
you might have trained your voice to kind of be more grateful or something like that. Then it's a bit better, then of course it's a bit more comfortable then. If your voice is most of the time really friendly and appreciative and kind, that's nice. It's kind of what you want. If, if at all, if you want to have any voice in your head, let it be a kind one, then it's at least a bit more beneficial than a complaining voice. Oh, that's wrong, and that doesn't... What is this guy talking about? Uh, constantly looking for what's wrong. Now, we call that a fault-finding mind. What's wrong with me? What's wrong with my life? What's wrong with my job? What's wrong with my boss? What's wrong with my friends? What's wrong with the world? There's a lot. There's a lot wrong. <laughs> you can find a lot that's wrong. What's wrong with my practice? Oh, there's a lot wrong with your practice. And because we're experts at finding faults, we can find them so fast it doesn't even take any effort. You can find faults in this room instantaneously. Just look a little bit around and you'll find, you quickly will find some faults. <laughs> Something's wrong. And then you look at yourself, you direct your eyes to yourself, you can quickly find something that's wrong. Now looking at other people around you, you can find something that's wrong. Easy. <laughs> because we're kind of masters at that. Thinking about why I need to suffer a little bit more now. I could... For example, if there is no apparent reason, I could sit down and think until I find something that I could suffer. Maybe everything is fine. I'm, I'm just standing somewhere. Just standing in, in, a, in a shopping mall, for example. You're just standing there. It's all good. It's, you're just standing there. There's just standing right now. There's no problem with it. But you can think, of course, until you find a problem. <laughs> And then you can stand there and worry about what will happen in 10 minutes. So you're not just standing there anymore. You're, other, you're not in the body. So then there is problems and there is a tons of them. And there will never be an end to them also, I guarantee you that. There will never be an end to problems in this world. You fix one, there is another one. It keeps going around and around. Now look at human history. Sometimes we, we complain, we say, well, aren't we learning from it? No, we're not. <laughs> because we're, we're not looking at ourselves. We keep looking around ourselves for the problem. It's a fundamental human trait. Our eyes look outward. They, they don't look back at yourself. They look at the world. Your ears are hearing the world. They're not hearing yourself. So meditation means you reverse that process. And this is not in our habit. So we need to create a new habit. That takes a bit of effort. And you would make that effort if you see the benefits of it. Like when you're contemplating why you should buy a new camera, why you should buy a new phone, why you should uh, get a new relationship. You do that because you're thinking about the benefits of it. And you're also thinking about the disadvantages of, of the other option that's not the good one. For example, what is the disadvantage of constantly being in a storm of thought? What's the advantage? This is something you want to contemplate. And I mean involuntary, impulsive, random thinking about whatever. I mean, look at your thoughts. Observe them. Are they really meaningful? Sometimes when I was at the monastery, I spent time with high-caliber meditators, great masters, fantastic people. We had these old Tibetan monks. They spent years and years in retreats. And my opinion, when I just came fresh to the monastery, was all very mystical and, you know, like the Tibetan monks, the older monks and all that. And so I, I, I developed this kind of fear of them because I thought maybe they can read my mind. <laughs> <laughs> so why would I be scared that they read my mind? First of all, is my mind worth reading? 
second of all, why would they read my mind? And third question I would have to myself is, why be scared? If everything's all right with myself, why would I need to be scared of other people knowing my deepest inner secrets? <laughs> what I'm thinking. Imagine, there's a new kind of Google thing. They're not just filming the, the streets with their cars now, but they're filming your mind also. And it's kind of visible for everyone. Everyone can just look at your mind. Is that something you would feel proud of? Is your mind a piece of art? Is it inspiring? Is it kind, radiant, beautiful, clear? Or is it just chaotic? <laughs> that you need to look for yourself, right? This is nothing I can tell you. Your mind is chaotic. You need to make it unchaotic. That's what I cannot tell you. You need to see this. You need to look at your mind and, and see throughout the day, really observe. Like, how do you spend your time, right? How do you spend, for example, the time waiting at a traffic light? Are you sitting in your car or are you thinking about other stuff? How is it when you're washing the dishes? Are you washing the dishes or are you thinking about other things? Brushing your teeth, taking a shower, eating breakfast. When are you ever there? <laughs> So contemplating like this, it makes us feel, wow, I need to do something about this. I want to taste some stillness. Now what's the benefit of stillness? Why would we cultivate stillness in the mind? Or why would we cultivate feeling the body, you know, connecting to the body? Because that's the end of this uh, insane story making in the mind, which is constantly going on. It finds an end if you really start to feel your body. The mind slows down. At first it just slows down. That's what you want. And if it slows down just enough, if you spend enough time, I don't mean, hey, feel your feet and you're like, oh, I feel my feet, and then the next joke, and the next one, and then something else. But take enough time, feel. One minute, two minutes, settle. You will start to discover something amazing. As you're standing there or sitting there or lying there and your thoughts are slowly subsiding, happiness comes up. Like a s s sort of joy. You start to feel like this buzzing in your body, the aliveness, and it feels really good. And why is that? Well, because all the problem making comes to an end. You're now not experiencing a problem, you're experiencing life, your body. It's that simple. But we're so addicted to problems that we constantly go back. Even if you have a teacher in front of your face that constantly brings you back, you come back up into the head all the time. Why hurt yourself so much? Why don't stop? Why not just settle and relax? Why not allow yourself to be at peace, to bliss out, to be comfortable at ease right here, right now? Answer is because it's a form of ill will towards ourselves. We don't really love ourselves. That's the symptom that continues restlessness, the escape into other things. Why would we need to escape into other thoughts and the future and the past if we were totally comfortable and content now? There would be no need to be elsewhere in your mind. There's no need to run away from this. You're totally settled. And in that settledness, there's great joy, great happiness. That kind of joy that you had when you were a baby, when you were not a serious adult yet. With a serious adult mind, with serious adult problems. <laughs> 
in a serious adult world. And with all these kind of children that are, yeah, well, they don't know yet. Life is still ahead of them. They will see soon enough. Uh, life is pr pretty dreadful and it's a struggle and hard and tough and we need to all try our best to move on and work for retirement and then hopefully everything will be fine one day once you've got it all together. Uh, until then you need to struggle your heart out. <laughs> That's a, all, all that is a manifestation of ill will towards ourselves. We are not allowing ourselves the joy of being here. It's, it's so odd. And how does that manifest? In your meditation, you're sitting down, your mind wants to be anywhere but here. How many minutes more? There's so much future. How, and the more future there is, the more you are in pain. The more you are in pain, the more you want to escape. It's a, it's a vicious cycle because we're not content now. So we need to cultivate that, this contentment, being satisfied with the way it is. And we start by again and again and again. It's like drops, consistently dropping, dripping, dripping, consistently onto one point. We have to really make this kind of effort to remember that you're here. Because everything inside of ourselves is geared towards, hopefully I'll be there soon. So we totally forget that we are here already. And so life turns into this endless kind of chase, almost like a frantic chase for the next entertainment, the next thing, the next consumption. And then, sure, then the world is full of people who are unhappy with the way it is. And unhappy people do unhappy things. So as long as people are unhappy, the world will not change. It doesn't matter how many more buttons we have, if unhappy people are pushing them, it doesn't fix anything. It doesn't matter how, how we lower the levels of pollution, we're still totally polluted inside by being unsatisfied, unhappy with the way it is. So things will not change like that. If you would like to change the world and make it into a better place, then free the world from your suffering. Free the world from your stress. Free the world from your unhappiness. That's the best you can do. And then act, and then your actions will be incredibly powerful, either on a large scale or on a small scale. But they will be powerful and beneficial and lasting. So this requires this repetition. Remember, again and again, remember your body. Remember it. You know, most of the time you do, will not have someone that walks alongside you and constantly says, yeah, yeah, but do you right now feel your body? Oh, yeah, yeah, totally forgot. You need to do that for yourself. And that's how you are becoming someone that learns the skill of meditation. Guided meditation kind of does it for you. It reminds you. But you need to learn the skill of reminding yourself. That's why the word sati, mindfulness, it means remembrance. If you translate, it means remembrance. So you're remembering, for example, the body or the breath. Or you remember that you are here because we forget. And so repetition is the gateway for that. How do you increase the feeling of the body? By being content with it, by repeating, by coming back to it. Why would you do that? Because you're kind to yourself and friendly to yourself. You give yourself a break. You take care of yourself. You're loving and caring towards yourself. That's why you would do that. You take yourself out of the stress-making machine of your head for a little while. You know, It's like a holiday. Ajahn Chah called it a holiday of the heart. We rest. We give ourselves a break. Holiday. 
It's a good word for meditation. So that is first question. Apart from meditating, are there other methods to increase feeling of the body? Just remembrance. Okay, additionally, in the video you say that you inform your mindfulness. How do you do that? So you can inform your mindfulness. What I mean by that is you can direct it. You can, for example, inform it to look at a specific aspect. You can just be mindful. Let's say you're washing the dishes, so you're mindful of the feeling. Feeling the body as it moves while it washes the dishes. You turn on the light, you flip the switch. You're mindful of the sound. Just hearing sound, hearing, feeling. As you walk, you just know that you're walking. Now you're informing your mindfulness, for example, by paying attention that the walking doesn't last. So you're looking at a specific aspect of the phenomenon you're observing. You're not just observing it, but you're observing something specific. And why would we observe something specific? For example, you can observe three things, the so-called three characteristics. When we are observing them, when we're looking at phenomena that arise in the present moment, and you see them in terms of three characteristics, the first one being um, impermanence, that nothing lasts, that everything is really momentary. It's just like a flickering. You feel the aliveness in your body as a buzzing. You feel it all around you as a buzzing, a vibration. You're experiencing the world in terms of a rapid change, a flow, a process. Not anymore as things like rigid, solid stuff that's separate from one another and has nothing to do with one another. You're experiencing the, the impermanent flow in this moment of whatever arises you see that it is passing also, moment by moment. So that means you're not, not, not just looking at what is going on, but you're looking at something very specific. The second aspect you can look at is the, the aspect that whatever you are picking up, whatever you're holding on to, it, it doesn't satisfy you. Impossible. You're waiting for the meditation to end, but it is not satisfying. It even isn't in that moment, because you're holding something. That can, we can observe that too. As soon as you're holding on to something, you suffer it. You suffer the weight of it. As soon as you feel as an owner of something, a manager of something, a doer, you suffer the doing. That is something you can observe too. And the third characteristic we can observe is characteristic of not-self. Basically, whatever arises, you see it as this is not me and it is not mine. It is merely an appearance that arises and passes. It's just something happening. The body is just something happening. The mind is a condition happening. That's it. None of that belongs to anyone. And that's why would we have a look? Why would we conf uh, inform our mindfulness in such a specific way? What's the point? The point is to transcend suffering. So you can inform your mindfulness in a way that doesn't lead to the end of suffering, like uh, a race car driver, very mindful, but it doesn't lead to the end of suffering. Or you can inform your mindfulness so that it precisely leads to the end of stress. It means you're kind of determining the direction or what you're looking at. That is one aspect of informing your mindfulness, what you're looking at, the specific details of what you're looking at. Another aspect is how you're looking. You can, for example, inform your mindfulness or charge your mindfulness with kindness. You can look at something with kind eyes, with benevolence. You can look at something with compassion, seeing that there is another being that suffers. May that being be free from suffering. 
wishing someone to be free from suffering. That is compassion. Wishing someone to be well and happy, including yourself, of course, that is kindness. Metta, you are informing your mindfulness. You're looking at something with a very specific taste or through very specific eyes, kind eyes, compassionate eyes. So depending upon how you are looking at things or what you are looking at, there are specific results. And ideally, the result is the end of suffering, release, the end of stress, no more pain. So you're not here as a walking problem, but you're simply here. Yeah, it's my life story. It's like a, I'm, a, this, I'm this problem solver. I constantly need to solve problems. So it's like you're, we're walking problems, huh? like this. As soon as we are not here, as soon as we are here, fully present, that's where spiritual practice happens. Here is mindfulness. Here you're strengthening it. And then you have a choice of how you're informing your mindfulness, how you're looking at things, with kindness, with forgiveness, with softness, warmth, friendliness. A type of informed mindfulness is also fault-finding. You can look at something and find fault in it. It is mindfulness, but it's what the Buddha calls wrong mindfulness, micca sati. There is sammasati, which means perfect mindfulness, and there is michasati, which means wrong mindfulness. The perfect mindfulness is always a mindfulness which aims at the end of suffering, which aims at release, aims at letting go. Wrong mindfulness aims just simply at, either at just looking at objects, for the sake of looking at objects, or for the sake of complaining, if it is informed, mindfulness, it is finding fault or something like this. It, all that requires mindfulness. Mindfulness is continuously working in us. It's not that we have no mindfulness, but the way our mindfulness operates is very confusing. And it is not serving ourselves, and not serving other beings. So that's why we can inform it with kindness. It becomes more beneficial. So that's what I was talking about when, talking about informing mindfulness in the I must have talked about it in some video. I forgot. I don't know. Okay. So that's all that comes to mind about this for today.